Late evening with Nightline. Have a good evening and good night. From ABC, this is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Sitting in tonight, Ted Koppel in Washington. Good evening. This could turn out to be one of the most extraordinary days in recent Polish history. Indeed, it might be one of the most remarkable events in the modern history of Eastern Europe. Poland tonight seems on the verge of electing as its prime minister a man who was jailed by the government only a few years ago. Tonight in Warsaw, a coalition of deputies from Solidarity and two other non-communist parties passed a resolution calling for a government under the leadership of Lech Wałęsa. Jim Hickey reports now on the events leading up to that resolution. Lech Wałęsa arrived in Warsaw tonight amid the increasing talk that he could be Poland's next prime minister. These are the people who are doing most of the talking, members of parliament from Solidarity, the United Peasant Party, and the Democratic Party meeting together tonight. The Peasant Party, once tied to the Communists, today threw its weight behind Solidarity and Wałęsa's plan to form a coalition government. With the Democrats already backing the plan, Solidarity and its new allies have a majority in Parliament. And Solidarity drafted a resolution for tonight's meeting, naming Wałęsa as Prime Minister. Looking very much the part, Wałęsa told the caucus they had no choice but to form a non-communist coalition. This is not what Polish communists bargained for when they agreed to democratic elections. The party leader today complained that Wałęsa's coalition plan violates agreements between the communists and the opposition. He said it's now an open fight for power and warned that the situation is dangerous. Wałęsa has tried to soothe Communist Party jitters both here and in Moscow by proposing that sensitive ministries such as defense and interior remain in communist hands. He's also made assurances that under a solidarity-led coalition, Poland would not upset the Warsaw Pact alliance. A Soviet spokesman today called Wałęsa's comments sensible and said Moscow would not interfere in what he called the internal affairs of this country. That seems to put to rest, for the time being, fears that the Soviet Union might try to prevent a non-communist coalition. The question tonight is, what do Polish communists plan to do about it? Jim Hickey, ABC News, Warsaw. We'll have a lot more on this story later this evening on Nightline. In Lebanon today, a lull in the fighting that is turning Beirut into a city of refugees and rubble. It comes less than 24 hours after the United Nations called for a ceasefire. But as ABC's Jerry King reports, there is a question whether the lull is a response to the UN or simply both sides taking a breather before the killing starts again. Early today, the shelling had been heavy. No hint that when the usual morning lull came, it would last more than the usual couple of hours. It did, though many Lebanese were convinced the respite was merely the calm before yet another storm. They used the time to shore up defenses around property and to seek visas from any foreign embassy that might issue them so they could get out of the country. The Christian strongman, General Aoun, said today he would observe a ceasefire. Syria's President Assad said he wanted to end the fighting, but eyewitnesses reported fresh Syrian troops were entering Lebanon. And late this afternoon, both factions began shelling each other again. As one Middle East observer noted, there are too many fighters around with too many causes. On the one side, it's estimated the Christians can muster 15,000 soldiers and militiamen, backed by 300 artillery pieces and 80 tanks. But ranged against them are an estimated 30,000 Lebanese Muslims, Palestinians, and pro-Iranian fighters, plus some 40,000 Syrian troops with at least 500 artillery pieces and 200 Soviet-supplied tanks. The Maronite Christians hold half of Beirut and the territory immediately to the north, a mere 315 square miles. The Syrians are reportedly massing troops now in several areas. Certainly, no one here in the Syrian capital expects President Assad and his Muslim allies to accept a ceasefire until General Aoun completely capitulates or is defeated militarily. Jerry King, ABC News, Damascus. President Assad has also had something to say about the hostages in Lebanon. He sent a message to Austria's President Kurt Waldheim condemning the killing of Colonel William Higgins and pledging to seek the release of all hostages in the region. The Pakistani foreign minister arrived in Tehran today where he's expected to discuss the hostages. The problem is, discuss them with whom? The hardliners or the moderates? Here's ABC's Mike Lee. 
The Iranian parliament today elected a radical anti-Western cleric named Mehdi Karoubi as its new speaker. His influence over lawmakers represents the latest in a series of what appears to be political losses for Iran's moderate president-elect, Hassami Rafsanjani. For example, yesterday Rafsanjani acknowledged that his formal takeover as head of state has been delayed. The outgoing president, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, refuses to step down and may hang on until his term officially ends in October. Friction between the two erupted in public this week, with Ali Khamenei angrily rejecting Rafsanjani's indirect offer to the U.S. for help on the hostage crisis. Rafsanjani has so far failed to form a new cabinet and is reportedly being pressured to include radicals like Ali Akbar Motashemi, the reputed paymaster of the Hezbollah kidnappers in Lebanon. In the end, Rafsanjani will form a government, and I think he will succeed in putting some of his uh, men in the key positions, but he will have to give and take. For the first time in 60 years, Iranian politics is no longer dominated by a single strong personality like the Shah or the Ayatollah Khomeini. The current process of dividing up the power means that Western governments, like their hostages, just have to wait and hope that eventually the moderates prevail. Mike Lee, ABC News, London. In a moment, staying cool under pressure, tapes of the conversations between the control tower and the United jet which crashed in Iowa last month. And later in the broadcast, a new idea in banking on the American agenda, putting your money where your ideals are, and a fractured arm.